Valerie Florence. I run the grant programs, and I'm going to take the opportunity to introduce our speaker, um, but also to, to welcome you to our informatics and data science lecture series. We hold three of these a year, and we bring in researchers who are working in areas that are relevant to NLM's strategic plan. Of course you know that, right? You know, we have a strategic plan focused on accelerating data-driven discovery, and we'll be talking about that today, but also we have a goal for supporting enhanced engagement with the audiences, a, a variety of audiences, including regular people, right? Not just physicians and researchers. So we're really delighted to have Noemi El Haddad here, um, who will be presenting her talk on advancing women's health through data science and personal health informatics. So she's an associate professor and co-interim chair of the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Columbia, so we're thrilled that she could even get away to come and give the talk and not have to video it in for us. And she, is also, she also has affiliations with Columbia's Computer Science Department and the Data Science Institute. She got her PhD in computer science from Columbia as well. So her research is really at the intersection of machine learning technology and medicine and inf medical information. And I think that combinations of observational data and patient-generated data and how we can bring those together and use them to improve health is really a hot area and needs all the attention it can get. Um, I want to say just a word you saw in the abstract about this, that the topic is, is endometriosis, a chronic inflammatory and estrogen-dependent condition. The sentence in that that really struck me was, despite its high prevalence, it, there is no cure, no known biomarker, no non-invasive diagnostic test. These are areas where I believe informatics and data science could be helpful. So I'm looking forward to hearing what Dr. El Haddad has to tell us. Thank you so much, Valerie. Um, hi, everyone. It's a, it's a great honor to be here. Um, I probably have too many slides, uh, and, but that's because I'm excited about this topic. And I'm really hoping to present to you kind of more of a research agenda than specific papers, although there are papers uh, discussed in here. But um, really, if there's, as Valerie said, if there's three key concepts that I want you to think about for this uh, talk is women's health, data science, and personal health informatics. And I'm going to ground um, all of my talk in this condition, endometriosis. So if you were to ask a gynecologist uh, what endometriosis is, they would tell you that it's, uh, maybe if they knew about it, they would tell you that it's um, a condition where we have cells that look a lot like endometrial cells, but instead of being inside the uterus where they naturally should be found, they're found outside of the uterus and they form lesions. Um, the only way to do a diagnosis at this point is through surgery, through laparoscopy, to look for these lesions. And symptoms, according to guidelines, are dysmenorrhea, which means pain during periods, and infertility, difficulty conceiving. Uh, and treatments are mostly surgical, more laparoscopic surgeries to remove these lesions, and hormonals most of the time to suppress the menstrual cycle uh, with the hope that it would stop the growing of the lesions. If you were to ask an epidemiologist what the condition is, they would tell you that it's estimated to be one in 10, estimated being the keyword here because we actually do not know uh, who has endometriosis and who doesn't. Uh, and there's a delayed diagnosis between four and 17 years throughout uh, the world. There is no established risk factors. There is an increased risk for ovarian cancer and heart disease. And we are starting to see publications about the high morbidity of the condition. So we, for example, have documented in the UK that there's a pretty high loss of productivity for women suffering from endometriosis, about an average of 10 hours a week. If you were to ask a clinical researcher now what endometriosis is like, uh, they would tell you that there's been many attempts at um, staging the disease or phenotyping the disease. There are different alternatives there, uh, but there's, uh, as I said in the abstract, there's no biomarkers to neither diagnose nor monitor the disease. There's no understanding of which treatments will work for whom and when. There's no cure, and there, we know that there's a genetic component, but we haven't found any explanation uh, that works for everyone. 
And so I really like this quote from Dr. Wilson that uh, characterized endometriosis as a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. Uh, there's really nothing known about this disease. Uh, and, and remember, the epidemiologist told us it's maybe 10% of women. These are all um, fascinating facts to me as a, as a scientist that there are still conditions where we really know not much about it. And these are just some examples of recent papers, including one from January 2019, which is basically calling for actions and begging the research community to find uh, more about this disease. So, what happens when we ask the patients? Well, we, this is just a, a simple survey we had done. Uh, within two days, we had 1,000 respondents, and we just asked them very simple questions. Where does it hurt? What have you been diagnosed with? We asked other questions, which I'll show you later. But this is what, it, what they tell us. Um, there's a variety of pain locations that they suffer from. They are all being uh, diagnosed with multiple conditions in addition to endometriosis. And they told us stories, uh, which are very hard to read, actually. Uh, things like, it has ruled and ruined my life since I was 13. I feel like I have no life. Um, Ando has taken my social life, sex life, and I have to struggle to work. I've been suffering since I was about 18, and I'm going to be 48. It left my body broken. There's um, a lot of um, very powerful patient voice on the internet. Uh, with chronic conditions in general, but for endometriosis, these are kind of the pictures that you would see in social networks for patients, uh, where people are counting the number of surgeries that they're going through and uh, talking about this concept of invisible illness, which is these chronic diseases where you don't have a physical disability that's visible to everyone, but you're really suffering and your life is highly impacted. So what's the problem? The problem, I think, is that there's a disconnect between the way patients experience a disease and its current scientific characterization. And so when I tried, what I tried to do when I showed you this, uh, you know, what the gynecologist would say, the clinical researchers, the epidemiologist, the patients, they all seem to say things that maybe have some common commonality, but there's still a very strong disconnect. Um, in particular, the proposed phenotypes and these stages do not correlate with the symptoms and the severity. So patients who are stage four, for example, might have very little uh, impact on their life and others would have debilitating pain and same for patients with stage one. The other inter interesting thing is that these characterizations ignore the way these symptoms uh, behave in patients, and in particular, the way they behave temporally. It's been uh, characterized mostly as a menstrually-related type of condition with like pain during periods. And so there's this idea that patients are in pain for maybe three, four days a month, and then, you know, go back to their normal lives. So the problem with this disconnect is that it impacts detection, it impacts monitoring, and it impacts research, right? So if clinicians don't know how to recognize a disease because they have the wrong mental model about the disease, patients are going to be left undiagnosed, their, their monitoring is not going to happen, and research is not going to continue because we're not collecting the right data. It also impacts patients beyond their health. Patients tell us that they feel alone, unheard, and frustrated. Uh, and they lose trust in their doctors. And this is not a good, uh, a good place to be in from a public health standpoint, but also from a simple human standpoint. So this problem that I just described for endometriosis is particularly heightened for this condition, but it's not the only condition where this happens. Uh, in fact, it's a little shocking how many conditions there are like that. These conditions where we have chronic um, patients who are left unheard because we don't have the right characterization of disease. Um, most of these conditions happen to be women's health condition, and so this is my only slide, in fact, that is general to women's health. Uh, if you have no time to read anything about women's health and potential inequities about, uh, that are related to gender, uh, I would suggest you write this paper, which is a, you read this paper, which is a seminal paper about the treatment of pain uh, from the healthcare system towards women. And if you have a little bit more time, I suggest you read this book that came out last, last year and uh, is actually a wonderful scientific book review of all the different ways in which there are gender inequities in healthcare and research. Okay, so 
there are, these are the two research questions I want to talk today about, and I'm going to spend most of my time on the first one, because that's what most of the things we've done, and tell you a little bit about the second one towards the end. Are we supposed to drink? We're not supposed to drink in this, except for the speaker. Okay. So, so the first question we wanted to ask was, how do we characterize the different ways in which the, patient ex the patients experience endometriosis? Okay, so basically this is a phenotyping question. We want to understand, we want to define the disease. Uh, the guidelines tell us that the disease is two symptoms, primarily period pain and infertility. Is there more? How does that happen? Those are the questions we want to investigate. So the first thing we did uh, is we went to the literature and we, did, uh, we retrieved from PubMed um, about 1,200 articles that were related to endometriosis and we did a content analysis. In fact, two students did a content analysis of these 1,200 papers. It was a lot of work. Um, and these are the kind of things that were identified. And we see here that there is indeed, like the, the scientific community, by the way, 1,200 articles is very little about a condition. I need to mention this first, which is really, you know, striking to me again. Um, but the, we, we find these two symptoms that are the guideline ones, pain and infertility, and there, uh, there's a most uh, written about, 339 papers and 395 papers talk about these symptoms. And then there's a variety of, um, of um, dimensions that are being researched. Treatments get a lot of uh, interest with medication, surgery, supplements, and a lot on hormones. So in other words, um, there is not a giant difference between the literature and the guidelines, is what I would, the way I would characterize it. So next we went to observational health data, and, uh, and here we are relying uh, heavily on RDCs, uh, the Network of Observational Health and Data Science Initiative uh, databases, and we built a phenotype definition or a cohort definition for endometriosis using our standardized database uh, at Columbia University. And so I, I don't want you to spend too much time looking at the details of the cohort definition, but my point here is that it's not like for any other cohort definition, it goes beyond just looking for one diagnosis code for a disease, right? So we need to spend a lot of time thinking about these things. And in fact, we, we tried many different cohort definitions, and this is the one that got, gave us the best uh, precision and recall across a cohort of, um, a, not a cohort, but a gold standard uh, data set of 1,400 patients. So armed with this cohort definition, we went to uh, all of our ODC collaborators and we asked them to run this cohort in their own databases. And the goal here was to get the largest amount possible of patient record or claims record about women that have been diagnosed with endometriosis so that we could see and characterize now from these observational health data what their conditions, their signs and symptoms, their medications, etc., were like. And so we did so, and we partnered with nine different databases. This is about 138 million uh, people in the United States. And out of those, 200, sorry, 2.28 million had uh, endometriosis. The, the one thing I want to point here is, remember how I said we have an estimated 10%? Uh, the, the prevalence in these databases is, is about 1%, and we don't know how to explain it. We know that there's underdiagnosis, but um, I think this is a major research question, is how many people actually have, di have di the disease exactly beyond the diagnosis. So we characterized, using the ODC tool, these 2 million um, patient cohort, and these are the percent of the top 20 or so uh, conditions that appear in our, in our cohort for enemy choosing patients. And I'm showing in a lighter color uh, what the prevalence is for each condition for our control uh, or comparison um, cohort, which are basically women between 15, 15 and 49 years old. Uh, and so we find our two uh, guideline symptoms here, dysmenorrhea and female infertility, but there are many more. Um, 
Similarly for medication, we find the, the uh, hormonal type of treatments, but we also notice that the most frequent ones are pain-related, uh, but really not so much for curing the pain, but as ways of managing the pain. So uh, analgesic, opioids, uh, etc., and a lot of antidepressants. Okay, so if we try to compare the guidelines and the literature um, and then the observational health data, we, what we're finding is that there is basically a wider range of problems experienced by patients and maybe dysmenorrhea and um, infertility is not the most important uh, symptom in there. Okay, so our last resort is to ask the patients. And so we, there are two parts really to this, uh, to this question. How do, are we going to characterize endometriosis from patient-generated health data? Uh, first, we need to have data collected uh, from patients with endometriosis about their experience. And so there's no, right now, you know, at the time when we created, we started the project, there was no such tool that would help us to collect. So I'm going to be talking about the, the app that we built and how we built it to be able to have this type of information. And then the second part of, of this characterization is going to be what do we do with the data now? Um, how can we use that to characterize the disease better? So um, personal health informatics is a very active field uh, of research. Uh, we are particularly interested in self-tracking within it, which is about uh, maybe you, you yourself have uh, used self-tracking is you go on your phone, you have an app, and you say, well, right now I feel, you know, excited to talk about my work, for example, and I track my emotions. Uh, maybe I can track my physical activity, etc. Uh, there are uh, passive trackers and active trackers. We're interested here in active trackers. We want to ask, we want to hear from the patients directly. Um, but again, this is a disease we hardly know anything about. So what should we ask to track is uh, the question we're asking ourselves here, right? Like, is physical activity important? Is my emotion important to track? What else? So we uh, spent about nine months on eliciting the dimensions relevant for self-tracking endometriosis. And the way we went at it was kind of thinking... Uh, of a mental model of disease that starts as a researcher-based, where we know from the literature and from uh, the observational health data network kind of what the conditions and the di dimensions of disease are. But we're going to go more and more towards uh, eliciting what the patients want and think about the disease. And so we went from interviews to focus groups to online surveys to uh, fully removing the researcher entirely and focusing on a content analysis of online endometriosis uh, uh, community. So the interviews and focus group helped us define those broad dimensions uh, and prioritize them. So pain, menstruation, other symptoms, a long list of other symptoms, self-management and treatment were identified as the most uh, important one. There were many others that patients asked about, but uh, most of the focus group was about uh, prioritizing what was most important. Um, what really uh, came about from the interviews was also the temporality of the symptom, that it was not going to be, uh, you know, we needed to be able to track daily, but even more precisely at the moment level. And so in other words, maybe my experience of pain in the morning was very different from my experience of pain in the afternoon. And so patients were really interested in this idea of, of tracking moment by moment. And finally, impact on daily life. So the online surveys told us about pain, self-management, medication. Uh, interestingly, the medications actually look very similar to the two million um, cohort characterization, which I think is uh, interesting. Um, and the content analysis, this is a, you know, helped us refine these variables, but the one thing I, we were struck by was actually, this is a bit of an NLP question, of a natural language processing question. Uh, at first, when we, we gathered all the symptoms from the online communities, those were the, the type of disorders and conditions that came about. Absence of endometriosis, drug seeker, hypochondria, somatic symptom disorder, and IBS, which is irritable bowel sy sy syndrome. Uh, and so we looked back at this. It didn't seem to fit with what patients were telling us. 
Um, and then we started annotating whether it was something that the patient experienced or something that was attributed to the patient. And so, in fact, these uh, top five disorders attributed by others were uh, what the healthcare system has been telling these patients, that they don't have endometriosis, they come to the ED for drugs uh, for relief of pain, and they're called drug seekers. Now, of course, this is very biased data set, right? These are patients who are venting to each other uh, on, a, on an online community, but I think it's still, again, reminding us about how little this disease is understood. So uh, the other thing that we asked patients was why would you, you know, we need to know why you would want to track. Um, because if we know why you want to track, maybe we can design better tools that are going to engage you in doing so. Uh, and so we found that there were really three reasons why they wanted to track. To improve provider communication. They felt that if they could come to their doctor with a printout of their symptoms, it would feel more real and it would be, they would be better, convincing, better at convincing their providers to listen to them. They wanted help with symptom management and they wanted to participate in research. In fact, they all had a very specific image in their mind of a teenage girl they wanted to help so that they wouldn't go through what they went through. And so that was very interesting to us uh, because these kind of like started uh, putting the seeds in our mind onto what kind of engagement techniques we want to use in order to have this app that we're about to build be actually useful for uh, patients. So we created uh, a community called Citizen Endo, and uh, it's built on citizen science principles because we found that patients were really interested in helping out with research and had a lot of questions. Uh, we do a lot of patient advocacy. These are some of the things that some of the events we did in the past year. We uh, go on the news and talk about endometriosis. We go on Reddit and do AMAs, answer questions from patients, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But primarily, we collect data from participants uh, but in a good way, not like the other guys. <laughs> so um, we built this app called Fando. Uh, Fando is a play on word for phenotype endometriosis. And it's a research app. So it's built on a research kit, uh, which is an open source software. There is consent within the app. It's all electronic. And we added a bunch of um, features that we know our particular participants were interested in. So these are some examples of things that you can do. You can track at the moment level, at the day level. You can track things like functional assessment of your activities of daily living. Uh, and I'm not talking about this, but there's actually a lot of research that goes on behind the design of each of these screens. Uh, for instance, the one with the pictures is an instrument validated by uh, colleagues at Cornell Tech who is in the team of Debra Estrin. So now today it's been, you know, we uh, launched Fando about two years ago. We have about 9,000 participants across 70 countries. And together, in, you know, they have about 211,000 moments that they told us about and tracked about 114,000 days. Um, if you add all the observations as a data scientist, which we're going to do in the next part of the talk, we're talking about 1.4 million observations, where one observation would be, you know, on Thursday at 7 a.m., there was a pelvic pain. That would be an example of observation. Um, interesting for us is the engagement uh, of the participants. About 2,000 of them have tracked for more than a month, and 8% have tracked for more than three months. So this is telling us that we can actually do something with this data. We have enough temporal variations to actually look for patterns here. So I'm going to go very quickly through this because I want to get to the data science, but these are the things that we have. These are actually a little old, these graphs, but um, their trends have not changed. Uh, we are finding that people actually do use the moments and tracks throughout the days. Uh, but also track uh, at night about their, their um, overall assessment of the day. Uh, and these are the different dimensions that they can track, GI symptoms, mood, pain, miscellaneous symptoms, medication, types of bleeding, uh, a general assessment, how was your day from amazing to terrible, uh, period, foods, exercises, activities, self-management, etc., etc. Uh, and sexual activity is here, 
uh, and it's pretty small and it's interesting. Uh, it might be because people don't want to tell us. It might also be because it's uh, by default, it's a question that is not shown to um, participants, in part because our protocol, our IRB at Columbia, asked us to leave it uh, by default not shown because we have participants starting at age 13. So, um, so you know, it's a, from a design of app, it's an interesting question. We don't have a good uh, answer as to why it's so small, but we nevertheless have a very good signal about that. Um, again, a little bit of an outdated uh, slide, but already after 2,000 participants, we had a very different picture of endometriosis pain than what guidelines are telling us. Um, Back pain and pelvic pain were the most uh, common ones, but really it looks like a systemic type of, uh, of um, pain pattern. And um, there, there are some theories around here as to why that might be happening. Um, a current theory right now is endometriosis, it's actually very inflammation based, and so really it's not the lesions that hurt, but it's a general inflammation in the body that is uh, triggering the pain. In other words, this is not because, you know, the 29% of participants have head pain. It's not because they have an endometriosis lesions in their head, which is, by the way, the, um, current, the thought uh, prior to the inflammation theory. These are some of the GI and urinary symptoms that we see. So these are just very uh, high level, the whole kind of like descriptive statistics about the population. Uh, endobelly is this idea of swelling uh, of the abdomen, and so 45% of participants have it, nausea, gas, diarrhea, etc. And there are uh, similarly for the other symptoms, what are they? Fatigue, 75% of participants have fatigue, which is not being tired, it's uh, common symptoms for people who have chronic diseases. Headache, mentally foggy, dizziness, hot flash, etc. These are some examples of foods and exercises. So these are customizable features, um, and uh, we see that people um, try different things basically, and they track different things alcohol, caffeine, coffee, dairy, gluten, red meat. Uh, and uh, some exercises help some people and doesn't, don't, ha don't help others. Running seems to be a particularly uh, uh, controversial type of exercise, apparently. These are some of the medications that our patients are telling us about. We are again using Odyssey here to map all of the medications that they tell us about to uh, uh, standard medication names. Okay. So there's a lot in this data set, and we're really, you know, we're eager to work with researchers in endometriosis who have very specific questions. You know, does CBD oil help uh, patients deal with their pain, for example? Uh, but what I'm going to be focusing on for the rest of the talk is kind of like the general machine learning question that we're going to ask about this data. So. The particular question we're interested in is the following. Looking at the descriptive statistics around the, the data set and going back to the literature and the observational uh, networks, health data networks, we're, we're clearly seeing a pattern which is that it's a very heterogeneous condition. And, and so in fact, if you want to characterize it, we need to think of it as a question of clustering, right? What are the different groups of patients uh, where two people are in the same group if they experience a disease similarly. And maybe from these groups, we can think of them as subtypes, potential subtypes, if anything, for the condition. And so this is kind of going with maybe you, you know, uh, there's a lot of talk about precision medicine and finding the right treatment for the right person. This is kind of going in, into these lines of uh, finding the group of people that behave together with the hope that treatment will be uh, similarly functioning for all of them. So some of the biases and some of the data characteristics of observational health data uh, we know about as informaticists. Uh, we spend a lot of time looking at electronic health record, at claims data, and we've been very good at... Um, spotting the biases, trying to mitigate them. But uh, there are some biases in every data set and self-tracking data is an observational type of data set as well. And so there are also biases, except we don't, uh, you know, we're, we don't know which ones they are yet as a field. And so it's an interesting um, 
question, but what we know for sure is that they look a lot like electronic health record in the sense that they are tracked, the data are tracked irregularly. They're tracked with a lot of uh, imperfections or noisy. In other words, uh, each individual data point that's collected, there is a little bit of uncertainty as to whether it was correct. Um, and uh, it's a heterogeneous data set. So we have all these different dimensions that I mentioned to you, right? We have the GI symptoms and the pain symptoms and the medications, etc. Now, from the standpoint of the uh, condition itself, it's an enigmatic condition. So how many subtypes are we looking for? We don't know. Uh, who has, has the subtypes? Who should be uh, with everyone else? How do we know that we're doing well on our clustering? We don't know. So um, when you don't know what you're looking for and you know you want to group people, you go to unsupervised learning and clustering in particular. Uh, and because we know that there's a lot of uncertainty about each data point, and you also have a lot of uncertainty as to whether people are actually very well separated or not very well separated. In other words, are there very clear clusters of people or is it, you know, trends of clusters? Um, the type of family of machine learning tools we're going to go to is uh, probabilistic models, okay? And in particular, we're going to go to mixed membership models. Mixed membership models are these uh, family of models that say that for every instance um, you want to cluster, uh, it's going to be assigned in a probabilistic way across a set of clusters, okay? So in other words, uh, to take the idea of a, of a patient that I'm trying to, sum, to phenotype into different subtypes. I'm, I'm saying that I'm going to, at the end of this process, I'm going to learn how to, to put people according to how much they belong to that subtype. So maybe they're 20% subtype 1, 30% subtype 2, and 50% uh, is the rest, subtype 3. Um, and, and similarly, all the features that I'm going to use to learn how to cluster the patients are also going to be assigned in a probabilistic fashion to these clusters. So each cluster can be explained by a distribution over these different symptoms. Because we have uh, many different data types and we don't know in advance uh, the relative weight of these data types and how they contribute to each phenotype, we're going to extend this mixed membership model to accommodate for this. So we, um, we used this model that we, um, we implemented and we uh, applied it to uh, about 3,000 of our participants. That's how many we had at the time of the paper. Um, and this is what we found. So this is a particularly, <laughs> there's a lot to read here. So I'm going to walk you through some of this. So, first of all, I'm showing you results for three phenotypes. We have results, in fact, for three and for four different phenotypes, and our clinical experts actually felt fine with both of these options. Um, so, but it's always easier to have less to show, so these are the results for three phenotypes. Um, so, each color it represents a dimension of a type of things that pa patients can be um, tracking. For example, in blue is all of the different uh, pain body locations uh, that are in pain. Uh, in dark blue are all the different adjectives that they use in order to describe the pain. Um, in, I need a lot of vocabulary for these colors. Uh, in orange and yellow, uh, the GI and urinary symptoms, we have type uh, severity of pain, uh, period pain, um, period patterns, medications, activities of daily living, and in light green all the way at the bottom left is kind of like that functional assessment of the day from unbearable to great. Okay, so I'm going to focus on a few of those and show them to you across phenotypes. So uh, pain, which is uh, a particularly predominant um, dimension. So phenotype 0, 1, and 2, uh, there are a few things we, we can see. Is, first of all, there's a lot of body locations that are affected that patients tell us about. That's the first thing we want to say. Here, by the way, the way we're presenting this, this visualization is telling us that everything is distributions of probabilities. And so we are showing, we, you know, we're showing the top, however, 
uh, things that contribute to 10% of that cluster. Okay, so these are, you know, uh, it's one way to visualize these distributions, but it's basically 10% of the mass of that cluster. So these are the main things that can explain the cluster, if you want. Uh, so there's a lot of them in all of the phenotypes, so it's not exactly like one phenotype is in much, much less pain from a body location standpoint, but nevertheless, for example, there are some that are particularly um, present for some phenotypes other than, uh, than others. Um, so vagina entrance into pain into the entrance of the vagina, for example, is one, and we have uh, also, which I haven't circled, but we have also uh, pain deeply into the vagina is uh, kind of uh, visible here, but much less explanatory power than in this phenotype, for example. Okay, uh, and you notice lower back pain is present in all of them, and pelvic pain is also present in all of them. Um, these are the pain severity. So 10%, again, we're not doing any threshold by the number of things, but rather by the, the mass that they uh, contribute to the distribution. And so uh, people in phenotype zero primarily self-track severe pain, while the two other phenotypes primarily self-track moderate pain. GI and, uh, and genital urinary symptoms, we find this endobelly, which I mentioned, which we knew was uh, frequent for everyone and is pretty prevalent for uh, every type of participant. But what's striking here is that in addition to all the GI symptoms, urination symptoms, frequent and painful urination, are only uh, explained um, in phenotype zero. So if you were, you know, we spend a lot of time looking at these things, but they're, they're, again, there's a lot to go through, but these are some of the examples in which these different phenotypes uh, look different from each other. So that's, uh, you know, that's nice to look at. We also have a way to assign what patients uh, primarily belong to according to this distribution, to which phenotype. And so how do we evaluate this? Well, remember, this is an unsupervised task. We don't have any gold standard labels. So we asked to compare. We asked uh, two clinicians, to, uh, two actually endometriosis surgeons, to go and take these participants' data and cluster them uh, whichever way they wanted. We just, the only requirement we asked them was find patients that look like each other, basically. And, and it's important not to tell them how we want them to, um, to group the patients because that's kind of what we want to evaluate. Are we grouping like a clinician would think? Uh, and so what we found is that uh, we had pretty good purity, which is one uh, very standard metric for evaluating this. Uh, in other words, there's a lot of uh, agreement between our type of phenotyping and the uh, surgeon's phenotyping. The other way we, we found was uh, useful to evaluate this was how do we um, assess the severity or assess the clinical meaningness, meaningfulness of, of these phenotypes. And so... Uh, maybe it wasn't clear, but this first phenotype here is what seems to be the most severe one, right, with severe pain, endobelly, and in fact, uh, what I haven't told you is that um, if you were to do this for every category, you would find that uh, it's very systemic. In other words, people who primarily belong to phenotype zero are severe in their pain, in their GI symptom. They have uh, hardly any sexual uh, activity, they avoid sex most of the time, whereas others have uh, painful or good sex. Uh, they have a lot of fatigue, etc., etc. Uh, and so what we did is we had asked a lot of our participants to take a um, questionnaire that is standard questionnaire in endometriosis research that goes through all of uh, medical history, uh, hereditary, like many, many questions. It takes about an hour and a half to take, in fact. And so we went back to all of these questions and tried to find if there was any associations between assignment to a phenotype and the answers to these questions. And that was, we thought, one way we could evaluate our phenotypes, right? So if people are in the severe or more severe phenotype, then what does that mean in terms of their answers to the clinical questionnaire? And we found that indeed it seemed like it was uh, finding what we wanted. So in the paper we give all of the associations, but I'm just showing you a few of them here. Um, 
phenotype zero, for example, was definitely associated with a heavier burden of disease. It was uh, significant for anxiety, depression, mood disorder, migraine, high blood pressure, PCOS, interstitial cystitis, which is a urinary uh, disorder, so that explains very well the urinary symptoms. The patients had a higher number of laparoscopies, surgeries uh, to treat endometriosis compared to other patients and a higher number of doctors seen before diagnosis. And the way we explain this, a higher number of doctors seen before diagnosis, by the way, those numbers are very high. People see six doctors on average to, before they get a diagnosis, is related to the systemic aspect of the disease, is our hypothesis, right? If, again, if the mental model of a, of a, of a gynecologist or a primary provider, for that matter, is period during pain and infertility, and a patient comes and says, I have urinary symptoms and GI symptoms and low back pain, they're not going to be sent towards the gynecologist and endometriosis. They're going to be sent on a very different trajectory. And, you know, for many patients, that's a good thing because maybe it's not endometriosis. But the point is that, again, when you have a severe uh, manifestation of the disease, it's very systemic, it's all across the body, it's going to be less and less easy to recognize. The last question we were interested in when evaluating uh, this phenotype was, uh, remember these data are collected by patients on their phone, and what if we only simply found that we clustered people by how much they track, right? Are, you, are we just these people who are more severe? Is it because they simply track more often than others or anything like that? Are we rediscovering practices of tracking or are we actually getting at a signal here? And so we just looked at the, uh, we did a heat map of all the 3,000 participants that we learned the phenotypes from, and we ordered them by their phenotype assignment, and we see three very nice uh, different clusters. But you see that when we try to order them by the number of days they tracked, there's no more correlations to the phenotype assignments, and there's also no more correlation when you order them by the number of the observations they track. In other words, um, we're really getting at a signal about what they track rather than how they track, which is good news for us. Okay, so um, I actually finished a little bit earlier than I thought this part of the talk, which is good, um, but I'm not done completely. Uh, so, <laughs> so I spent a lot of time, about 45 minutes, on that first question, right? And, and really, we were thinking about, we have the literature, we have the observational health data with this very large cohort of patients we built throughout the US, and then we spent a lot of time building this app that's going to help us collect data directly from patients. And then what do we do with this data? We use clustering methods and we find some sort of phenotypes. Wonderful. Now remember what the patients had told us. Why do they want to track? They want to help research. They did. But now it's time to give back, right? And the two things that they wanted was they want to self-manage better and an app would help them because it would help them figure out what changes throughout the day and throughout uh, the weeks and the months, and it would help them communicate better with their providers. So that's exactly what we're working on right now and what we got actually funding from NLM to do. So this is current work. This is currently what we have uh, in the app. We have very basic functionalities uh, for, I, I, I don't even dare to call them self-management functionalities, but there's a, the beginning of communication with a, your provider. So we provide a calendar kind of feature, and we kind of show you in a nice circular way what the type of things that you've been tracking, and then we allow you to go and on a web, a secure web, page and print all of your symptoms so that you can go to your doctor. And patients are okay with that. They'd like more, and we definitely would like more. So what are we working on? Um, two things. Again, this theme of personal health, informatics, and data science, and how they are very much interrelated. So we're designing tools for self-management, and we want these tools to be also helpful to ground shared understanding 
and to promote shared decision-making between patients and their care team. Remember, we said the doctors, patients feel alone, have lost trust in their doctors. So the question here is, how do we restore this trust, basically? And so we're, building, we're doing focus groups right now with uh, endospecialists, with patients, and next with patients and specialists together in a room. And right now, I'm very eager to know what's going to happen because patients told us some things, specialists told us other things. I'm not seeing a lot of, uh, <laughs> of commonality. So I think those focus groups are going to be really interesting. Um, from a data science standpoint, what we're looking at is uh, these end of one techniques. So we now have realized that um, patients are actually using the app long enough for us to have these trajectories of, or these data streams about themselves, and that people look um, sometimes like each other, but there's also a lot of triggers that might be very personal. And so we're looking for um, reinforcement learning techniques kind of thing to identify personal triggers and also to identify prescriptive type of actions to help with self-management. So um, that's all ongoing work and it's quite exciting. So I want to conclude and go back to these uh, three themes that I started with. Um, personal health informatics, it's a good thing. Uh, it helps us engage patients. We want to use these methods uh, to build more reliable tools so that we can collect meaningful data from people, but we can also feed back actionable insights to individuals and their care teams. And throughout these, uh, these goals, Data science techniques are helping us explore the potential biases in these patient-generated health data, discovering potential subtypes of disease, and identify individual trends in disease and management of disease. Uh, the, you know, I started with women's health, and I think this is everything that I've said here is still, again, very valid. All of these gender inequities, all of this gap that is happening uh, where scientists and patients and care providers are not hearing themselves, I think that both personal health informatics and data science actually have a, have a shot at bridging that gap. So with that, I want to end. I want to thank uh, all the people, my students in my lab and my collaborators who are amazing. Uh, I want to thank all the participants who have given us a lot of their time and a lot of very intimate and private information. Um, and I want to thank uh, the NLM for their training grant, first of all. <laughs> a lot of the work that is here is from one of my students, Molly McKillop, who just graduated and was on the training grant, and uh, the new R01 that we just got. Uh, and thank you very much. Questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a great question. So during the focus groups, we had a very strong signal from the patients that the, the classical way of asking, you know, how severe is your pain on a scale from 1 to 10 was not helpful uh, to the, for them. And so instead, we uh, gathered a really long list of adjectives and we kind of crowdsourced uh, the list of adjectives. So we didn't want to leave it as an open free, free text field, even though I'm you know, at the core, I'm an NLP researcher. I was like, for this, I don't want to do NLP. I'm just going to give examples of uh, adjectives, but we have about 25 of them. So there's like burning, shooting, etc. cetera. And uh, what was interesting, I think, in this is that one, the list kind of converged after we asked a few thousand people. <laughs> it doesn't keep on growing. But also people are using uh, the extent of this uh, of this vocabulary, uh, and that's something that they like very much. Uh, 
Yeah, so that's a great question. Is there any relation? So we were hoping to find relations, and what we're finding is not the way we want it. So <laughs> the severe patients who report a lot of pain, uh, severe pain, etc., are also the ones who have the highest burden of medication. Uh, they are on neuropathic type of uh, pain medication. They're on opioids. Uh, these are heavy-duty, you know, pain uh, medications, and yet there's the ones who report the most. So it's unclear. You know, I think it, there's a bit of a causality thing here. What we, what is more visible to us, maybe because of the time resolution of the data, is self-management techniques and and symptoms. So you know, self-management techniques are like pelvic uh, floor therapy, for example, and then we can look at whether a few days later or throughout the next few days there's a decrease in pain uh, and things like that. So my last question, uh, with your data being available, publicly available, because I saw some images with question and answers, and I know they are available to me, so... Yeah, so... <laughs> So we are at 9,200 participants. I'm waiting until we have 10,000, and then we're sharing it. And patients are aware of this. We obviously are sharing a de-identified, anonymized version of the data set, but that's absolutely right. We, wanna, we want more, you know, the hope is that uh, data-driven type of researchers are going to come to this data set and try a few things, uh, and hopefully that helps endometriosis research. You spoke about machine learning algorithms for clustering. And we know it is challenging because uh, we don't know what we're clustering and we don't know how to evaluate. So did you try any other methods and how were you able to convince yourself and the reviewers that the algorithm that you used is reasonable? Yeah, so we tried a few things, definitely. Um, we tried the, the very um, you know, hard type of clustering. The soft type of clustering made a, a whole lot more sense. So the type of evaluations that I showed were more on the quality side of things. What I didn't show was a lot of uh, when you have probabilistic methods, uh, graphical models in particular, uh, we can look at like the log likelihood on unseen data and things like that. And so we, we have all those results in the paper. But I think for me, I mean, it's, we want this. And if we didn't have this, we wouldn't move forward. But for me, what was the most interesting was the alignment with the way clinicians who know the disease well uh, also clustered people, and the very nice, clear type of associations between this clinical questionnaire that we didn't use in the clustering and the response of the clustering. Yeah? So I have a question. I'm a tracker, right? I track my sleep, and then I make changes to try and figure out how to make it better or worse. Do you find that they're doing that? Is that when these impersonal triggers, I was trying to figure out if they're starting to be observing their own experience more? Yeah. So, so absolutely, I think they are, and I'm also tracking my sleep with my ring. Uh, so, um, so we did in the app. We asked, we asked, kind of like we're interested in perceived. Um, you know, does it actually perceive trigger versus actual triggers? Uh, and so, in the app, when you self-track, self-management, food, um, exercise, there is also a question that says, "Did it help?" Uh, and yes, no, and then, so that's more of a, you know, what people perceive of, and it changes through time, so that's useful for us from a data standpoint, because we can see, if, you know, within a person trajectory, across people, etc. cetera, and, uh, but more interestingly, I think the reinforcement learning is exactly going towards that, so if the perceived is not always correct, uh, because there's still pain being uh, tracked after, for example, then can we uh, identify which sequence of actions make more sense to decrease uh, either pain or GI or anything like that? So we're, the, some of the tools that we're building are going... There's a question of also of interface, right? Like, how do you build an interface to help people conduct these experiments? And that's also uh, part of what we're working on, for sure. Yeah. Do you see a difference in the populations between those women who have had some kind of surgical intervention and those that do not? And I'm thinking that the difference would be both in terms of the 
perhaps how they present and how they describe themselves, but also in the, the kind of vocabulary they use to describe it or the ability of yeah. your clinicians to, to express what, what it is that they're going through because since they've had a procedure, it's tied to more standardized vocabulary. Right, that's a great question. So um, in the app, we, we were very eager to have control uh, people and no one who doesn't have endometriosis wants to use the app, so that's fine. But what we do have is a lot of people, we ask that at consent time, in fact, is, you know, have you been diagnosed through surgery? Have you been diagnosed because a doctor told you you probably have it? Or are you not diagnosed and think you have it? Or are you not diagnosed at all? Uh, and so everything that I showed you is people who have been diagnosed through surgery. But what was one of our question was what about these people who haven't had uh, surgery yet? Like what what do they look like? And they're as varied as the people who had surgery. And I think it comes back to this problem of uh, the treatments we have right now are not personalized in any way. Uh, surgery and and hormonal treatments are you know kind of given to patients without knowing if it's going to work. And so we're not finding any difference between. Um, the people who had surgeries and the people who didn't have surgeries. Thank you very much.